Well, listening to that is Ruth Chohan, who's a dementia specialist at Amber Care Solutions. Very good morning to you, Ruth. Morning, Richard. Let's talk a little bit about Jason when you hear his story there. Um, his project is he's basically obviously using his photos. Now, someone who works with people who live with dementia, and he's very much talking about it living with dementia as opposed to being a patient, because people can still live with very rich and productive lives, can't Absolutely. they? Jason's story may become more and more prevalent in the future, won't it? Because we're living longer for a start. Uh, yeah, that's absolutely that's absolutely right. Well, that um, you know, when I talk to people and say what I do, they'll say, "Oh, my mum, my dad, my auntie had um, had dementia." And that, and I have made no secret about the fact that my mum had the same vascular dementia that Jason has been diagnosed with, and I, I lost my mum to it in twenty twenty one. Now, this idea he's doing with the photos is this something quite common with photography to preserve the memories? I think photos are used to help people with um, with memories. I think it's because photos evoke memories in someone living with dementia because of the way that the brain processes visual information. And looking at photos, which is something that's quite commonly done when doing reminiscence um, therapy, that can activate the parts of the brain that are associated with visual and the emotional aspects of memory. And that means that the person with dementia can connect with moments and with emotions from their past. Now, when my mom had her mobility and when she was obviously, uh, you know, when she was like, you know, before it really took hold of her, you could show her a, pic a newspaper or something from the week and she wouldn't have a clue about who any of it was or any of the dates or any pictures. But show her a photograph for her as a child in Ireland growing up as an eight-year-old and she could tell you every single person in the picture. And that's the bit where it taps into those visual. And it's, it's some of it about the emotion. So it's taking her back to that time when she felt loved, when she felt as if she belonged. And I think that's what photos do for people living with dementia. One of the things, if people are listening this morning, if they've got a family member with dementia, one of the things I struggled with at the very start with my mum when she went like that was she was trying to get... She didn't think her home was her home. She thought she was, her family were missing her in Ireland and she needed to get back on the boat. She went right back to being a seven-year-old. Oh, my mum will be worried where I am. I've got to get back on the boat, I've got to get back. And I never knew what to do to tell her, well, are you not going on the boat or whether you're home? Because there was such distress in her face that she thought she wasn't home. That's very, very common. But when people are with dementia are saying that I want to go home, it's not necessarily that they want to go home, they want to go to that, that place. It's more about the feeling that they they want to be loved, they want to feel secure. Yeah. So it's that sense of security. And that's what a person who's caring for somebody with some dementia can actually provide that. So it it's you should never you should enter their world so live that's in their what, reality that that's it really and learning the way that you can do that and i think we learned that we learned as a family that that's the way to do it you have to basically look at it and put think some things to a side and so if they say we want to go home we want to go home. oh well, we're going home a bit later the boat's a bit choppy at the moment and then you know they might forget about it and move on to something else and there's no point in fighting it and saying you're at home because they, they don't, it just doesn't work you never convince you're them never convinced because that's them. their reality and you need to live in it now going back to the photos that jason's doing and um when you work with people who are living with dementia what are some of the coping mechanisms that you you see people doing or you would advocate or a good idea? Well, I think um, Jason, he mentioned them, didn't it? He? He's got a Dosset box. That's a little box where it's got the, tells you which time you need to take your, your tablets mm. with. So those are a really good thing. Things like um, making a list, so a reminder or just simply post-it notes are really good things to put around the, the house to remind you what you need to do. Uh, having a calendar where everybody knows what's supposed to be done So on again, what day and when. Um, um, a couple of coping mechanisms my mum used to do is she used to keep a paper calendar in a handbag, amongst other things. But she would get the calendar out. This is when she was sort of had her mobility and, you know, to the outside world looking and you wouldn't know because it was before any of the physical aspects took place. Um, she used to basically say, oh, I've noticed this on the calendar here. Uh, we're so and so is coming round on Friday. But what she was really doing was she was trying to get me to tell her what the time, the day of the week was. And working around it, so I would say, oh, well, it's Wednesday today. That's what she really wanted. Yeah. 
You can get really good clocks that actually I tell you the day of the day Surely of the week one. and the time and whether it's morning or afternoon because yeah. that's sometimes difficult for somebody to distinguish between. It's, uh, we got it from um, it, it looks like a tablet and it's just sat in the kitchen and it was time, day, weather. Uh, day of the week, really useful in the early stages when obviously that information yeah. was still done. Um, what about some other ones I, in terms of, you said personally, I mean, you haven't been diagnosed with dementia, but you've got some cognitive impairment yourself, you've been I diagnosed. Have. I've got mild cognitive impairment. So what are some of your coping mechanisms? Then, right? uh, lots of lists, lists telling me where I've made a list <laughs> I need to, to go to. I use my phone a lot for reminders. I use um, Alexa and there are other things available but to remind me about taking my, my tablets. Um, I am just a very organised person and always have been, and I've brought that into my life of um, living with um, cognitive impairment um, issues. But just always been on top of top of things, and that, that's where I've always had to be. Now, I kind of learnt on the job with my personal situation, and I, and I was like, you know, there is a lot of support out there. Um, Equally, there's some things that I didn't know. Do you know what I mean? And where's a good place to get sort of information if maybe if you're like going down this road at the beginning like I was a few years ago? There's lots of different places that you can go to and I think you have to find the place that's right for you. Alzheimer's Society, they have their um, dementia advisors who are a really good source. Admiral Nurses from Dementia UK, they're very good at supporting carers. Mm. Um, but then there's also community organisations like our, ourselves and in Coventry, where we are, there's the Coventry Dementia Partnership Hub up, that's in Co Hol Brooks. People will know it's the old main Monday day centre. Yes. And that's a place, it's, it's got a lovely cafe, but there's always people there that you can talk to. And it's about meeting other people as well who are in the same situation as, as yourself. And it's about seeing people, perhaps people like me, who are able to carry on a job and yeah. live a, yeah. an active life with um, cognitive impairment and yeah. problems. What, what, I'll tell you, one of the things was getting that diagnosis. And it was really tough to get my mum to go through to do this that we actually had to basically tell a fib and say, oh, you can't have your driving licence back until you've done this test. Because she just flat didn't want to acknowledge it. But getting the diagnosis formally, boy, was that a good thing to do? Because that opens up whole new avenues of support mechanisms that you're entitled to as a family with that formal diagnosis. My advice is, as much as it's difficult, do it. Don't you think? No, that, that's absolutely true. But I, I also think that it's difficult for people to actually accept that perhaps there are issues with, yeah. with their memory. Yeah. And I, I think it's uh, quiet conversations with and, and not being judgmental and not saying you've got to go to, to the doctors, yeah. but just trying to show to them that there may be, may be issues there. And I, I think that sometimes it... I, I don't think it's right to, to tell lies to, to people of why you're going to um, do something. And, and maybe people think that is what the only thing that they're able to, to do. But there are other things. So you can suggest things like maybe both of us could go and have a health check and we could go and see the doctor for that. And then the topic can, can come up um, there. But it's just being able to talk openly about the issues that there are. But at the end of the day, people have autonomy yeah, yeah. and it's their decision. And they've still, they still got their free, the free will, haven't they? They have, they the have. But I think what you strong, said... Strong Irish woman, you know, that, yeah. never went. that never went. No. I think what you were saying, though, about the benefits of going, that that's something yeah. that, that can be put across. Yeah. And also as well, I mean... Um, <sighs> One of the other things which I thought was really useful is what is, is with going back to the photos. She would keep them all in her handbag and she would write down the names of everyone on the photos. And that was a really useful way for her to be able to still engage in contact. That, that's something that really worked for her. So if you knew so and so was coming, she could get the photo out, see the picture of them, and then know that that person. And it sort of kicked in on the short term memory for that time she needed it to do. I think that photos are also very good for maintaining a sense of identity for um, for people. And I always say that um, when you get the diagnosis of dementia, that's the time when you should start building that life story. So putting together things like photographs, things that you like to do, so that then when you are at the point when you're not able to communicate very well with people, you've got that there that you can share with them. They know who you are yeah. because you never lose who you are. I'm still Ruth. I'm still me. Yeah. And that 
that's the same for anybody that's living with dementia. And we like you just the way you are, Ruth. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming in this morning and sharing your story with us as well. So, yeah, uh, lots of information available online if you want to do it. The fantastic story of Jason is obviously doing those photo memories. Weekday afternoons from...